before we begin, I have some news. We're all gonna die. No, I mean it. Think about it. It's true, right? It is gonna happen. Uh, you know, it could happen today, right? If a meteor came and, or if, you know, nuclear war kicks off and Russia decides that they've had enough with our Ukrainian adventure, we can seriously die at any moment. As a matter of fact, getting up and rolling out of bed, uh, you're taking a risk going outside. I mean, who knows? You can get shot. You can die, right? Just by living as human beings, we're taking that risk. So a human being that is unwilling to risk their life is also unwilling to live. But when it comes to the linchpin, the ideological linchpin of the green agenda, the whole thing is about this blackmail that if we continue to be human beings, and if we continue to develop the forces of production, which is what defines human beings and distinguishes them from animals, that we're going to go extinct and we're going to annihilate ourselves. The thing that distinguishes man from animal is that man cannot dwell at the precipice of extinction, not at least consciously. Our lives are mediated with a sense of meaning. And where this meaning comes from is of decisive significance for all of the philosophical and theological questions pertaining to humanity's existence. The conclusion of history as we know it, human history, whether you're coming at this from a Hegelian perspective or the Kojavean perspective, who's, which is also a Hegelian perspective, I guess, there comes a point at which mankind reaches something that's called the end of history. And the end of history amounts to a resolution of the antagonism and the conflict driving human history forward. Human history is not simply a history of economics and a history of differing relations to nature and the forces of production. It's also a political history. It's also a history of conflict between people and not just with nature. And so in the supposed resolution of history as we know it in the form of the end of wars, real wars, right? The war to end all wars was the Second World War, which, and we've never really had a war since then. So the end of history culminates in a state of universal recognition and universal freedom and the breaking down of barriers between mankind and you know, all that globalist bullshit that we're accustomed to, right? And there's a grain of truth to it. So how has antagonism at the heart of human existence reintroduced ourself, itself uh, after the end of history? It seems it has reintroduced itself in the form of something called ecology. And when we think of that word, and I know it's a hideous word, and I reach for my gun whenever I hear it, you know, I saw. But at the root of this word ecology is the Greek word oikos, which is about a more fundamental living being of humanity. How do we dwell? How do we live? How do we reproduce our own existence? This concerns not only our relationship to the natural environment, but the environment that we create through our own labor. And the central antagonism since then, it seems to me, seems to be about the way in which human beings themselves have come to mark some kind of abruption, some kind of blemish, some kind of scandalous existence amidst this smooth continuum of global space of the end of history. The very fact of living, breathing human beings, asserting their existence and asserting their lives seems to be a dangerous thing nowadays. The Malthusian ideology goes very deep into the history of liberal modernity. Liberal modernity affords no recognition to human beings who are inherently contradictory. It only affords recognition to some kind of universal ideal or universal subject. And it is in the name of this universal subject that the green agenda is being pushed. 
we're all going to die, which is what they tell us, the we, the subject that they're referring to, is the universal subject of liberal modernity. So what is the status of this supposedly universal subject culminating at the end of history? In August of 2012, striking workers in South Africa decided that they had enough of the accursed and forsaken existence bestowed upon them by the end of history. And so in Marikana, they decided to assert their lives and assert their right to existence. And they were met with a massacre by the South African police. We see the same in Palestine. We see the same in the um, Appalachia in America. We see all over the world with the yellow vests in France, humanity has definitively become an accursed and forsaken being in our world. And so the green agenda is a type of infinite regress. There is nothing we can do to satisfy their demands to stop being so prominent in this world. However much we reduce our carbon footprint, it's going to be more and more and more until our very breathing is seen as a pollution. Because from the perspective of liberal modernity, humanity itself is a stain uh, on reality. As for the threat that in pursuit of the realization of the essence of man, we will somehow stumble upon our own annihilation, to that I say, so be it. If humanity, in asserting its existence and fulfilling its cosmological mission, stumbles upon its own collective annihilation, that is a dignified and worthy end, and it amounts to the significance and the meaning that human life poses for the universe. It's a dignified end in comparison to the slow and poisoned and undignified death that now awaits us at the end of history, where we simply pursue hedonistic goals of pleasure and um, safety, and, and basically we become domesticated into animals. As a matter of fact, the very insistence, the very risk uh, of one's life is what defines us as human beings. We don't simply live and dwell like animals do, waiting to die someday. We live and die for a reason. If we have nothing to die for, we have nothing to live for. Before, in service to the state in uh, circumstances of war, humanity proves the meaning of its life. Now, in a war which I hope sorry, in a future which I hope will be devoid of war, humanity can assert its existence through a collective struggle with nature and the outside world, which, just like in a war, does come with the threat and the risk of death. If we do not prove our life, as Kojev, drawing from Hegel, um, so much emphasized, then the only fate that awaits us is slavery. Right now, we are witnessing a global insurgency of collective mankind rising up against this really anti-human globalist agenda, which wants to grind us into dust and turn us into worms. To that I say, we are on the precipice and on the verge of a global awakening of the people of the world who are going to awaken from their slumber like lions. And why shouldn't they? They have nothing to lose. Certainly not their life, which they lost at Marikana. When I uh, first began streaming online and putting myself out there, I used to have the view that with leftists, there maybe can still be some kind of dialogue. Maybe this is not an actual primary contradiction, but it's just 
a disagreement and there's this battle to acquire hegemony among them. And for a long time and very slowly, I came to realize that there was something completely irredeemable about the left. And I gave a speech in Austin. outlining this fact, but the event that has fundamentally changed uh, my outlook and because of which I think there is no point of, uh, there's no possibility of returning to this view that there's something redeemable about the left was the savage, bestial, and inhuman responses that they gave to the murder of Daria Dugina. When I saw those responses, I realized that this entire time, all of the smack they've been talking wasn't just some unserious, whatever, disagreement ideologically. These people genuinely want to kill us. They genuinely want to see us dead because we have crossed the line of what they consider acceptable as far as what views you're allowed to have and what stances you're allowed to take. We're no longer dealing with a situation of reasoned dialogue between human beings. We're dealing with a war of Schmittian absolute enmity for which there can be no dialogue, there can be no forgiveness, and there can be no exchange of ideas. They have decided, and not us, because a reasonable human being would never initiate a conflict on the basis of ideas, but they have condemned us on that basis, and they've left us with no choice but to treat them that way. The truth of the matter is that the war that they've waged against all dissidents and against all people with opposing views is part of a more fundamental war, which is actually related to the topic of this conference. It's about a caricature of humanity in the form of the universal global subject, the member of the open society, the ideal subject, the politically correct subject, who's a citizen of the world, and real humanity, humanity in the depths of Tartarus, humanity as the working class confronting the real threshold that defines our relationship to nature and ourselves, which is actually what defines us as a species. This humanity, the one that was murdered at Marikana, the one that's oppressed in Palestine, the one that's oppressed in America and throughout the entire world, has no place in this world. And when we give voice to this proletariat, we are condemning not only the system, but all of those who've decided there can be no humanity outside of the straitjacketed ideal version they've created. So when we speak, we're not just speaking. For them, it's like we're firing bullets. We're waging guerrilla warfare on their entire world and on their entire constrained perception of what it means to be a human being. For them, our words are mightier than bullets. They're more vicious than bombs. And that's why they've decided that those of us who step out are worthy of death. I did not know Daria personally, but I could say that there was nothing fundamental I really disagreed with her about. The views of her and her father have shaped my understanding of the world so profoundly that I took it personally. They weren't just talking about Daria when they were celebrating her death. That could have been any one of us, and they would have talked about us in the same exact way. They don't care that we have families. They don't care that we're human beings. They don't care that there's a reality to us beyond ideology. They decided to draw a line, a threshold. You're either in it or you're out. And that threshold for them is what defines humanity. But the truth is that the real threshold defining humanity is not established discursively. It's established materially and principally by the proletariat of the world in their living existence and in their relationship to nature and mankind. 
That's the real threshold defining what humanity is. And that's why the proletariat as a class doesn't just represent itself. It represents true universal humanity and all of its authenticity and all of its real being. That's why it is the universal class and that is why it is destined to win this world.